Hey, it's Todd, and I'm talking about Save or Die. What is Save or Die? It's probably the most emblematic of the old school mechanics, though it's not a mechanic in and of itself, and probably the one that is most maligned since then. It is in itself a thing. Basically, it's a saving throw, uh, like any other saving throw, only in the save or die sense, the effect that you're saving against was deemed to be so overwhelming that there was no roll for damage or roll for any other effect. It was just so overwhelming to you that if you missed the save, that was it, you perished. And this was something that mostly came up in terms of, or in regards to poisons, uh, or including spores from yellow mold, things of that nature. And I think to modern sensibilities, and probably even sensibilities of people who were playing back when this rule was in effect in older editions, that it could feel very unfair, right? Because if you walk into a room, you do something, a spider drops down on you, surprise round, it takes a little bite, save versus poison, miss your save, you die. Bam, over. And there's not a lot of ways to mitigate it at that stage. So it can feel, uh, from a certain viewpoint, it feels very arbitrary. Your character never had a chance. They walked in, this thing happened, now they're dead. But it is something that, while it can feel unfair, and granted, with some bad luck, and luck is always a factor, it can be unfair. But I think it also is something that demonstrates a lot of the natures of what the kind of old school gritty sort of game was about, right? Because when you look at what the save or die sort of mechanism represents, it represents, one, that your character is mortal. They're not promised any particular outcome. You're not the hero that is destined to rescue the princess at the end. You may be the hero that dies in some musty attic somewhere they may die in the first room of the boathouse because they walked in and didn't look over above their heads and then the spider drops down bites them and they're dead or they went to look they went to rob the first tomb that they ever robbed that they didn't pay attention to the dusting of yellow spores that's on the lid of the sarcophagus they move the lid out comes a, a burst of spores they breathe them in, they don't make their save, they die. So it's always this reminder built in these sort of things that you can go at any point in time. You are not promised a lot of chances necessarily. You have to make your own chances. Things are lethal. The world is a bad, bad place that you're going into and the odds are stacked against you. I think the other thing is that it emphasizes the sort of preparation and uh, techniques that you need to use when you're in these spaces. You can't take anything for granted. And I've, I've found in my experience that often when players, either as I'm a player, and a fellow player in a group, or if I'm refereeing a group, that it's often those ch chances, those times where you let your guard down, where you think you know everything, you think you've got everything mastered, and then you don't do maybe one of the things you normally do, and that's when these things tend to leap out at you and it's like a big reminder and you or your character or another character in your party pays an ultimate price for that potentially but it's also that learning element or that reminder of hey these dungeons aren't your friends you think you know what it's all about you don't know what it's all about you think you were comfortable you thought you kind of had done everything you didn't have everything covered so having a kind of save or die effect like that emphasizes the sort of games that the old school kind of games were aiming for, right? Which is one, it's lethal. Two, your character's not special, and therefore you can die to a spider bite. You can die to just breathing in some mold. And three, emphasizing the kind of gameplay type of things they want you to do. They want you to be listening at doors. They want you to, if you open the door, to look around. You know, use whatever tools you have. You know, if Maybe one group would say, I'm going to use that 10-foot pole and I'm going to stick it in the door and wiggle it around to see if anything drops on it. That's one strategy. Maybe another strategy would be I'll put a mirror and I'll angle the mirror inside the room and see if I can look at what's inside the room without going into it. 
or I'm going to be cognizant of details in the room. And these are things that I think when I was playing with a lot of people, when we all grew up on these games together, there, you know, you would always have these sort of warning signs or things you would look for. So you might open the door to a room. Are there any webs in the room? Is there anything uh, th that could indicate that there's some spider dropping out? How high are the ceilings? Can I see the tops of the ceilings? Is anything covering them? Like all these steps that you will end up going through, these sort of procedures were to, were, you know, were born out of our experiences of either having close calls and maybe we make our saves and it's lucky or having these tragedies, tragedies where a character we liked or one of our fellow characters, you know, died unfortunately to a spider or to mold or something like that. So with those in mind or with those, you know, that being said, the way the game has evolved, it's probably evolved away from where the type of save or die type situation is one that's warranted. Uh, because the other feature of back in the day play was that characters were cheap. If you were a low level character, it was very easy to make. You could roll one up in a couple minutes you weren't generally thinking of tying them into overarching campaign plots or backstories. You know, you might have something, a simple backstory, maybe a sentence, maybe just I'm from the local village, you know, or not even that, maybe it's something you develop over time. The, uh, basically, the point is, is that it was not an involved process of character creation. Very fast, very cheap in, as far as your commitments and, and therefore your attachment Right, it's it's the the characters that will make it through those first couple of ventures. Those are the ones that you get attached to, and maybe that's where you start building your backstory. That level one character that's just entering the fray. Gen generally speaking, he's just somebody, and you may like him, and you may like the stats he rolled or whatever. But you know, easy come, easy go. In the modern game, where you're putting in potentially hours into developing characters and complicated backstories and backgrounds and all this and that and how they fit into this campaign having something just, you know, snap their fingers and drop him uh, is not that equation of what's worthwhile, the pain versus what maybe you gain from that, that starts to swing as to maybe it's not worth it anymore to have that kind of device. And the other thing to keep in mind, in 5th edition you get a taste of this, maybe your first couple levels, but still not to the degree you do in old school games, is that your characters are truly disposable. Not only are they easy and cheap as far as your investment to create, but they're super, super fragile. You're going to have a handful of hit points, maybe if you're lucky, six or so, but probably I think it's not uncommon to see guys rolling around with one, two, three, four hit points. And at that point, you're one, you're, you're, you're one damage roll away from dying. Damage from whatever you want it to be. It could be from you know from a monster attack it could be from a trap uh, a, a trap in the floor a trap on a on a door a trap on a chest a falling rock a, you trip and fall down a hill i mean anything can kill you and so at that kind of level save or die isn't really too out of place because really you could just rephrase it as save or die versus overwhelming damage because if you let's say you were going and you fell down a 30 foot well you know 3d6 is gonna be essentially save or die to most characters unless the gm is super the referee super unlucky or super low rolling and you rolled high chances are anything that's gonna roll 3d6 of damage and let alone any kind of higher die you're toast so save or die is almost just a shortcut is saying look this poison does 66 worth of damage you're not gonna have more than six hit points basically we're just gonna say that you're dead and what probably doesn't get brought up a lot right is that the save or die type mechanics are going to be most painful most lethal at those low levels when basically everything is almost save or die because when you get to mid levels and you get to high levels you're going to have lots of ways to mitigate death you're going to get enough money you're going to be able to go and get resurrection or try reincarnation, different spells. You're going to have spells or access to spells. Maybe you're going to have magic items that will give you extra bonuses to avoid poison or make you immune to poison altogether. Or, may, you know, or you can cast some other kind of spell, a wish spell, for example, that you could use to undo 
something. So when you get to mid and, and high levels, then you get some new saber die stuff. There are high level spells that can kill you, whatnot. But the sort of gotcha kind of moments become rarer because now you can prep for them. You've you've sort of passed that level to which you're worrying too much about the small spider that's hidden up in the webs, right? One, you have all this knowledge that you've gained through all these other characters, whoever died, so that your mid-level to high-level characters could survive. You have all that game experience, which is going to help you out and obviate a lot of the dangers. And then you're going to have the equipment and access to the tools and spells and you know institutions that will also help you overcome save or die situations. So given that, it's not like there's some kind of random hit by lightning that you're just going to die, right? So it's not arbitrary in that sense. And I would argue that when it's done well, and I think in most cases, uh, y you know, it's done in a way that makes sense as far as the creature that's doing it. You know, it's not a mouse that you go to feed, it nips your hand, and it's got super rabies and kills you, right? That doesn't make sense. Fictionally, we don't, unless they're gonna, we're going to establish that there's some kind of mega rabies out there and these little mice, right? It doesn't make sense. But spiders and creatures like that, we know, have poisons. We know have venoms. And so from a standpoint of how you're supposed to think of it as, as a character and therefore as a player, we understand that there are risks associated with being getting bit by spiders. It's things we have to deal with in, in our own day, and it's things that in the kind of hyper danger of the game world, particularly in the underworld of the dungeons that you know that you visit, that this is a real, you know, a real thing. The other part of it that doesn't make it really arbitrary is that there are lots of ways to mitigate it. You just have to mitigate it before it actually happens. I think someone will say, I got surprised by the spider and it bit me. There was nothing I could do. And yes, there was nothing you could do at that moment. But generally, there's probably a lot of things that you could have done that led up to that moment. How many decisions did you make that you might have done differently, been maybe a little bit more careful or taken different steps before you got to that point, right? So if you enter a room that's full of webs and you don't do anything and you take five feet steps and you start to go maybe towards, oh, there's a chest in the middle of the room and you start to head towards there and you sort of ignore because there wasn't a kobold or an army of gnolls or a bunch of orcs in the room. So you say, oh, it's just a just cobwebs. I'm going to go check out the chest and then bam, the spider happens to you. Yes, when the spider drops, you had no options, but you had options all the way up to that point. So as a player, you have to learn to be wary, to be mindful of your surroundings. Now, obviously, if you're a jerk DM and, you're, and you say, oh, the room is clear and there's nothing absolutely in there, and yet you're hiding a spider in the ceiling, yeah, then maybe you get to be like, hey, that's a little bit of unfair baseball, right? I didn't have enough information to make smart decisions. That's a different problem. Um, and one that I don't think is the fault of the mechanic so much as it is you have to be on the same page as a referee you have to put your players in situations they can make smart choices you know things should be telegraphed in a certain way or if they're not it should be telegraphed in a way to be strange because strangeness or unusual circumstances is also one of those warning signs if you're walking through a dungeon and every room is dusty and or dank and it's just bones everywhere and refuse and you enter one room and it's pristine and it's clean and there's nothing there at all then that itself is the warning sign you know that is the thing that does not fit it's it's not that it's you know everything else is dirty well we understand we're going in a place that maybe hasn't really been inhabited for a long time but now this room is clean and neat and it smells of lemon zest this is where you start to say okay i'm being to be super careful going in here because I know something's off, right? That becomes the thing you look at. But these are all things that you, you get trained as you play to know. And yeah, the first time save or die hits you, it may be lethal, but you hope that there's a lesson. And the lesson isn't just that this game's unfair, your referee hates you, and just things are going to drop out of nowhere and kill you without anything. It's that thinking of, damn, I should have checked the ceiling, or, oh, I got distracted by this chest. You know, 
it should be that thing of there was a lesson to be learned. And it was an important mechanic, I think, for teaching those lessons. And it certainly was memorable, memorable and additive to the game. And I think a lot of people who maybe took out Save or Die, it's something that they should consider if you're going to take it out. What are you putting in and it adds? Is going to add something back in? Because I think that just taking it out does remove something. I think it's a net loss to how you play the game. So if you do remove it, you want to think about why am I removing it and what can I do to replace it with something that maybe fits the character that I want for my game. If I don't want something with that instant lethality, what can I add in its place that's going to be a net positive to the experience? In my case, I actually made a rule for my Lamentations of the Flame Princess game, play by post game for poisons that replaced the simple save or die mechanic. I did not do that because I was really unsatisfied with having an instant death sort of feel. What I wanted more was to be able to create moments, and I wanted that, that tension that comes with time. Because save or die is essentially instant. You, just roll the, you fail the save, you die. I wanted to have that tension of what do you do when you're given enough time that maybe you have options, right? What do you do with that? How do your characters address it? How does that work in the world? Instead of someone just keeling over and dying, now maybe they're suffering for an hour, slowly dying. How do you try to save them? Do you try to save them? And what kind of moments does that introduce? And I think the my inspiration for that thinking was Fellowship of the Ring, right? Frodo gets stabbed by the Morgul blade. You could easily visualize that as a save or die type situation. He saves... You know, he, he resists the, uh, the whatever the magic or the poison in the Morgul Blade. If he doesn't, he dies and becomes a wraith. But obviously in the book, him succeeding or him failing, you know, you could look at it that, yeah, he succeeded, but there was all that suffering and all that time, and how did they, how did they deal with that? And what did the Fellowship have to do? They had to, you know, take him and escape from Weathertop. They had to find the King's Foil. They had to try to escape through the wilderness. They had to get help from the elves. They had to race that race across to the river. They had to get across the river. They had to get to Elrond, who finally could try to make some kind of medicinal or you know, use his elven magic to save them. All those moments were built out of the tension of him suffering and potentially dying. And that is something that Saber Eye doesn't give you because it's immediate. So I wanted something that said, okay, I want to give them that tension of, they're dying, what do you do? As opposed to, well, they're dead, what do you do, right? So that was my thinking. And I feel like the rule that I made for poisons, drawing out that process, gives something to my game that just having them die outright doesn't do, even if the ultimate outcome may be the same. And I should probably note that it actually so far failed in the case of my game because I did have one player whose character succumbed to poison from a spider bite Similar to what I spoke about before, they were walking down a corridor, they were surprised, and surprise is, is doom in old games, it's always a bad sign, they were surprised, spiders dropped down, they actually were doing a fairly good job fighting it off, but you only have to get unlucky, you know, once or twice, right? Spider attacked, spider bit, failed save, down he went, dying of this poison. And my hope, and... I will say that there's probably a lesson in here for me as a referee. I probably did not make it clear that I was open to options because I think they took the fact that he was dying of poison to basically be that there was this foregone conclusion he was going to die instead of just dying right away, which maybe for them would have been the most polite thing to do. He was going to die over time. So what they ended up doing is dragging him back out of the grave or out of this cave they were in and leaving him to die in their camp while they went back in to explore more of the caves. You know, this is... You know, it's a little bit of a faux pas, I think, as an adventurer. But, you know, they were hardcore about wanting to get in and continue their exploring. And they weren't going to let one of their compatriots slowly succumbing to a spider venom, you know, to slow them down. Whereas what I really was hoping for was that they would take this opportunity to think about, well, could they possibly save him? Now, again, I blame myself because I think that they really weren't thinking that was a possibility. I think they're really just thinking about, okay, he's not dying right away, but he's going to die in a couple of hours. 
we don't have any anti venom. We don't have any magic, healing magic that can undo the poison. So it's just a matter of time he's going to die. So whatever, we're going to let him die. Which wasn't what I was going for. I was really going for more of the fact that to, to say to them, hey, I'm open. I'm open to you trying to do different things. I'm open to you, you know, uh, looking for solutions that are maybe not by the book. You know, because the book just says poison, fatal, over. And if it's immediate, yeah, it's over. You, you, you don't have any time to do anything else. But if you have time, I, you know, I was hoping that someone would say, let me try to find the, whatever, the equivalent of King's Foil to try to slow it down or stop it or what can I do? And that, I think, was my fault because I did not hit my players to the fact that I was open to other possibilities. But really, the point of this example was that, yes, I took this Saber Die element out of my game, but I had an idea in mind of what I wanted to replace it with that was going to give me a feel that I was looking for. In that case, kind of the tension that comes with things taking time and sort of the possibilities that that opens up when you have time to address something. But I think if you're not going to do that, I would hesitate to just remove it because you have a visceral emotional reaction to this instant death. Because if you take it out of context, if you look at it on its own, yeah, it seems cruel it seems arbitrary, it seems mean, but there's more to it than that, and I hope that, you know, listening to this, uh, to me talking about it in this video, will sort of, in, in maybe a clumsy way, express some of the things that Save or Die actually does, you know, what it can do, what it can be, what it represents in the game, and that it, 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 it could possibly have a place, you know, maybe not in the, in the modern game as it is conceived, though, you know, like I said, potentially, it, maybe it's still there in, in some form. Obviously, anything with massive damage is essentially going to be a save or die to a low-level character anyway, but, you know, different different thing. In any case, that it, it had a place, and maybe that place has passed. Maybe it hasn't. You know, games like Lamentations of the Flame Princess have brought it back in some regards with some of the things they've added in their games. Um, and maybe it's something that will be looked at in the future as a mechanic that deserves a second look at, or at least as a, you know, addendum or, or a, a potential penalty associated with the mechanic. In any case, that's Save or Die. I hope you enjoyed this video. If you did, please think about subscribing. It helps me out a lot. Uh, if you feel like contributing in other ways, I do have a Patreon. The link is in the show notes, and that's another way to support uh, support me in, in making these videos if you, f if you feel so inclined. Otherwise, I will talk to you later.